Hello, fellow Transformers fans. Today is April 9th, 2021, and I'm Ben Yee coming at you with a reaction video about today's Hasbro Pulse Fan Fest 2021 event. Today, uh, in lieu of having the normal Toy Fair event that's held every year, Hasbro held a virtual event online that featured, among other things, a slew of Transformers reveals. We had Wave 3 of Kingdom, the return of Shattered Glass, yes, you heard that right, and an auto-transforming Optimus Prime figure that has to be seen to be believed. So on top of the normal news that I post online and on my website, fans asked me for my reactions to everything. Um, normally I would type that out and just kind of post an article, but I thought, you know what? This was special enough. I was excited enough that I thought, let's do something a little bit different. So this is my first type of reaction video I've ever done. Um, I'm gonna ask you folks to go easy on me in the comments. You'll notice my headset keeps kind of disappearing in the background. I'm using Zoom to record this with a background from Earth Wars. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy this. Uh, it's meant to be lighthearted, fun, and all about the love. So let's get started. All righty, folks. Well, let's kick this off with the longest series of reveals that came out of today's event, and that was focused around Wave 3 of the War for Cybertron Kingdom series. Kingdom, for those not in the know, blends Generation 1 characters with characters from the Beast Wars era and other characters that are based on the concept of the Beast Wars era but haven't been seen before. Uh, the reveals covered every class from core to deluxe to Titan. So uh, I'm going to go through them in the order that they were provided to me uh, by Hasbro in their press release. The link below shows my coverage and that's the order I'll be going in. You can see images there as well. You'll see some small ones kind of popping up on the side here, but nothing does them justice unless you look at the actual images provided. So let's go. So first up, Scorponok. All right, so the amazing thing about these new Beast Wars figures is they didn't go for pure cartoon accuracy in both modes. What they did was they decided we're going to give them cartoon accurate robot modes, but the Beast modes were going to be more real life looking. I'm doing air quotes here because uh, they, you know, they're kind of fantasy animals, but they're not. But when you look at Scorponok, he looks super creepy. And I think we have to be real. I loved the Beast Wars show, but they did make the characters look almost cartoony, and I know that's an ironic statement, uh, in beast mode. And that was so they could emote and express in very specific ways. And I think it worked well for the show. However, for an action figure, having this creepy, semi-realistic looking scorpion mode was a fantastic choice. And man, just look at the little pock marks and stuff along the shell uh, and all the tiny little details like the, the mouth and the eyes and everything. They did a bang up job on that. Of course, the robot mode is beautiful. He's got Cyber B. Cyber B is love. Cyber B is life. That's that's what I say. I, I've always loved the little guy, and I'm so glad they included a show accurate Cyber B in with this figure. Uh, yes, I agree with some comments that the legs could be a tad longer in robot mode. He could stand a bit taller. Uh, but you know what? Given the overall awesomeness of this figure and the fact that we're even getting a Beast Wars Scorponok in 2021, I'm fine looking past, you know, maybe a millimeter or two on the leg length. All right, next up is Wingfinger, who is a member of a group called the Fossilizers. Now, the Fossilizers are those new Beast Wars inspired toys that I mentioned before. Uh, they are essentially dinosaur skeletons or skeletons of ancient creatures who can split apart and become armor or weapons for other characters. So they are taking the place of the weaponizers and the modulators from previous lines. Um, it's very cool that with Wingfinger, we're getting a maximal fossilizer. Uh, the first couple were Predacons, which is appropriate, but you know, the good guys need some armor and weaponry too. Uh, what I also love is just like the other fossilizers, he looks really alien and creepy. There's something unsettling about him, even though he's a good guy. Um, very different body form than your typical transformer. Not a lot of blocks, not a lot of angles. He's bony, he's sharp, he's more organic looking, and I love it. And plus, Wingfinger has a combiner head. That's right. So a piece of him becomes a head for a combiner 
that I believe is assembled from a Ractonite, a Paleo T-Rex, and a wing finger together. And for you guys who are troop building fossilizers like I am, uh, this is going to be an even bigger treat because there's a good chance you could probably put together even a crazier monstrosity uh, than even Hasbro showed today on their presentation. Next up is Deluxe Class Trax, who, oh man, the moment that image appeared on screen, the only thing that went through my head was beautiful sculpt, mini masterpiece. Uh, very similar to the studio series Hot Rod they did uh, recently for the 1986 movie. It really looks like the cartoon character just jumped into plastic form at a non-masterpiece price. Um, it's a controversial choice. Some people don't like faux parts or faux car or jet mode parts in robot mode. I have no problem with them. I think they serve a very specific purpose. I think it is better for them to give him the sliver profile with the faux uh, cabin section on his chest than try to create extra hinges and try to artificially fold uh, the existing cabin section into a tinier cabin section and then wind up having lots of pieces snapping off and so on. I like the decision they made. I know it creates a backpack, but let's face it. I mean, my opinion on back the backpack thing is as long as it doesn't set the figure off balance, you know what? My figures all face front in my display. Don't know about yours. Um, I also dig the turning missile rack that's mounted on top. That's not something I would have even thought of to do. And he's got a flying car mode, which is absolutely essential. I know it's just the wings in his robot modes kind of sticking out in the car mode. I know, but they could have excised it if they didn't want to go for that cartoon accuracy. But it really feels like, in its own way, this is the studio series version of Tracks, meaning to represent his appearance in the original series. And I'm, I'm all over it. Um, moving on to Rhinox. Now, Rhinox, everyone has to understand, is my absolute favorite Beast Wars character. He is the character I loved when I first watched the show. Uh, and to this day, he still remains my favorite character in that program. Now, a lot of people online are already talking about, what about the Thrilling 30 version? Isn't that a superior version of Rhinox? You know what? In some respects, you're not wrong, okay? Uh, to a degree, um, I, you know, I would say the one that's most evident to me is his weapons. Now, I am super happy he has the old chain guns of doom, right? It's awesome. Fans love it. But... If you kind of look at them from certain angles, you realize that they're not quite as robust as the ones that came with the Thrilling 30 figure. Um, they look like they probably have to slot into him somewhere in Beast Mode, so they had to cram them into a probably very narrow slot. So unfortunately, they don't have that big boxy piece on the back, and that's unfortunate. I had really hoped that they would have that, but honestly, if you listen to me, I, the biggest complaint I have about this figure is his accessories. So it's not that bad and he does take on a slightly different aesthetic i think it's like you know having two different artists draw the same comic book character right you had one set of engineers you know x amount of years ago doing the thrilling 30 version and he came out a very specific way kind of the pseudo mashup of the cartoon and the generation style of the time this looks like they were aiming more for the cartoon which is probably more most evident in the chest design that has this wide part that is ostensibly the lower jaw of the beast mode. But of course, there's no way to really stretch that. Um, so yes, it's a faux chest. Uh, reference my earlier comments about faux parts. I'm fine with it. I think the robot mode design looks great. Uh, the face is a little bit weird looking to me at certain angles, but I get a feeling that's an angle thing. I think up close, it's going to look much more show accurate. And a lot of that faith for me, is coming from looking at Black Arachnia, Optimus Primal, and Megatron, all the earlier Kingdom figures from Waves 1 and 2, who, frankly, do a great job of representing their counterparts in the animation. So I have faith that Rhinox will be that, too. Um, and big shout out for the beast mode it's got this wonderful pattern on the skin uh yeah so one, one of my friends commented hey rhinos don't have teeth like that you're, you're not wrong uh but the way he was portrayed in the cartoon and the original toy for some reason he had these kind of scary honking looking teeth and they were evident especially in robot mode so there you go i mean it's it's a aesthetic choice based on a sci-fi universe where you know, aliens who transformed into beasts were running around millions of years ago. I say just roll with it. 
Uh, okay, next up, Galvatron. Now, Galvatron is a leader class figure representing the uh, crazed out Decepticon leader from the uh, 1986 film and the third season of the cartoon. Uh, Galvatron was the subject of a lot of leaks early on. So a lot of fans uh, got a good look at him from uh, what I'll call fan shots, not professional shots, but really nice shots done by fans who managed to get their hands on him early on. And the biggest sticking point that I think a lot of people had, and I share this concern, is his legs looked a little stumpy in some of those early photos. Uh, but these photos really do him justice. And I think my concerns about the proportions of the character have been uh, assuaged a bit, partly by the photos that were released, but also partly by Hasbro's video presentation, which is linked in the description below. Uh, the key here, I think, is angles. And, and I hate to say it, I don't think it's that the other fans who got him early didn't extend his legs properly or whatever. I think it's just how you look at him, what angle you're looking at him from, how do you photograph him? And I think it, it's very possible that at some, in some angles, in some positions, he will kind of look out of proportion. I think that's a strong possibility. But the fact is there are many angles where he doesn't. So that works for me. I think from an aesthetic point of view, they nailed his almost humanoid wearing a suit of armor look. Uh, they have a lot of the key design elements, including allowing his cannon to either attach to his bicep or his forearm. Uh, the matrix chain is a wonderful touch. And I really dig that his two extra weapons combine into the ship that Unicron gave him in the movie because that is a good size to go along with your HasLab Unicron. That's what we got one. Um, I love when they work things into one figure that can be applied to another figure or go with another figure. And this is a beautiful example of that. Um, one thing I am curious about, one thing I'm a little bit worried about is how does he measure up in terms of mass to leader class Ultra Magnus, either from Siege or uh, kingdom, right? That that Magnus was not the tallest Magnus we've ever gotten, but he was certainly chunky, and he certainly had some good mass to him. In fact, uh, if you look, if you weighed the Siege Magnus, he actually has a little more weight, I think, as I recall, than the Combiner Wars version, which was taller, but a lot more hollow. So I hope he weighs and uh, up against Magnus well. I hope the two weights aren't too far apart, because the fears some fans have is that Galvatron is basically a Voyager class being priced at a leader class with just a couple extra accessories. It's possible. We won't know until everyone starts getting him in hand. Um, but I'm hoping maybe he could be a little lighter than Magnus, but not significantly so. All right. So the Titan class continues with the Ark. Now, uh, in the original Beast Wars Transformers cartoon, the Ark played a significant role. Uh, as the Maximals, the heroes of the story, wound up having to protect the Ark in order to protect their future. So having the Ark as the Titan class figure for this line makes perfect sense from a thematic standpoint. And man, you know, this is one of those toys that fills the toy I've wanted since I was a little kid quota. So I'm already predisposed to really digging it. Uh, but you know what? Hasbro went above and beyond. I love the homage to the last Autobot. So now that ties a little bit in of the original Marvel uh, comics run that I grew up with. Uh, having mainframe, the action master, transform into Teletran 1 is an inspired idea. First of all, how else are you really going to get mainframe into the main line unless you pull a Perceptor and have them turn into some type of ATV vehicle or something like that? most people aren't going to want to buy a walking talking computer terminal but as part of this set it makes perfect sense and to be fair now that people have seen this if they did redeco him in his traditional action master colors i know a quite a few fans who would order him as a selects figure um i will also say that i am very happy that sky spy hasn't been forgotten that he's included and until today, it wasn't known that the golden discs would be included, both the Earth one and the Vok one. And that is a beautiful way of tying in and representing the Generation 1 and Beast Wars elements that tie into uh, being uh, the line we know as Kingdom. Uh, now, some criticisms uh, that folks have, and they're valid, is you got these big 
gaps on the sides in vehicle mode, right? Where his legs swing out. And sure, yes, they probably could have created panels that would have folded in and covered that up and everything. And, you know, I think there's validity to the argument that at a $150 price point, $160 price point, what's another couple of panels? But I trust that there's certain cost evaluations that go into this. I'm not sure I want to pay another $5 or $10 just for a couple of panels that fill in a gap in a mode that I'm probably not going to keep this figure in. Just for storage purposes, just for space purposes, he's probably going to remain in robot mode on my shelf. So I'm cool with that. And you know what? Even as the ship, I think he looks beautiful. Or it. I don't even know if I was supposed to call him a he yet. Um, but whatever he is, or it is, I love the arc. It's a piece that little Ben in me, that nine-year-old Ben in me has wanted for a long time. And it's something I'm really looking forward to. And for those curious, I have pre-ordered too. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, Rodimus Prime is a commander class figure. Now, this is one that also was uh, revealed a while ago. Takara put out pictures before Hasbro did. So fans have already gotten an official look at this uh, to some degree. I love, love, love the way the robot mode looks. I love, love, love that his matrix fits in his chest. And that sounds nowadays like, so what? But there was a time where having any Prime with a chest compartment that would fit the matrix was a big deal. In the late 90s, when Big Convoy was released and he could fit a matrix in his chest and he had handles that he could hold the matrix with, this was a stunning, stunning, stunning thing for fans. And I remember that time. And even now, after Power of the Primes, where like everybody and their brother could apparently hold a matrix of some sort, uh, even now, I think it's a significant design um, design uh, addition to any prime figure. Uh, I appreciate all the places, especially the bottom of the trailer where you could store blast effects parts, weaponry, and so on. That's super cool. And it is cool that a deluxe class figure can fit into his trailer. That's not something I expected. Um, all that said, I do wish there was something else other than the cannons, other than the trailer, other than the main figure, because after the incredible offerings of Jetfire and Skylinks in the Commander class, it feels like there's it just needs that one little thing to send it over the edge. Uh, just as one example, uh, if they had maybe included a core class wheelie figure that was movie accurate, uh, something just to value add, to send it over that edge where I feel right now it resides between a leader and a commander class, something small like that would have sent it over that. Or perhaps, you know, the trailer unfolding into a base or something like that. Uh, and I know it can connect to other bases, but I mean, give it more toyetic base-like things, maybe another couple of ramps extensions, or maybe small control center and control panel type details. Uh, anything like that, I think would have helped push it over that edge a little more. That said, I still pre-ordered the thing today. So, hey, <laughs> all right. So uh, while it is related to Kingdom, uh, there is a deluxe class figure that's being offered as part of the Selects line in the cardboard box and everything. And it's labeled under War for Cybertron, but the press release does have it under Kingdom as well. And that's Tricranius, who is a uh, redeco of the um, Ractonite fossilizer figure. Uh, he's a Triceratops uh, who has an amazing, amazing deco of some black and orange and, and 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 yellow and he just looks like he came rising out of lava like a second ago and it's an incredible incredible deco uh also really cool uh it was revealed in the inside of the packaging unlike right now where most selects you open up you open it up and it's just cardboard inside there will actually be a color uh illustration of the character on the inside which i think is a nice value add to the packaging uh, i think most people i know just open the package and just toss it because it's just a brown cardboard box um this gives people a reason to hold on to it and uh add something for those mint in box collectors to to appreciate um, but the big thing is he comes with a pile, I think 19 or something, some crazy number of blast effects. And I am a huge blast effect fan. I think it's super cool when Japanese companies do it in like SH figure arts type toys, but to have it in the transformers line, uh, is really cool. And I was kind of worried that after the initial introduction with Battle Masters, it was just going to go away since Battle Masters have, have long since left shelves. Um, but 
it is great to see that they are continuing in some way. Uh, I use them in my toy photography, but I also just love how it adds a level of play value in a very simple manner uh, to these toys. So combine fossilizers, which I love, and blast effects, which I love, into one pack. That's a no-brainer, and I've already ordered two. Seriously. Yeah, I know. Again. All right. So let's go to the core class. So the core class uh, introduced Soundwave uh, as a core class figure to go along with Megatron and Starscream, who have already been released. And that wave just started hitting shelves now. I am a huge fan of pocket-sized Transformers, whether it was the old Legends class or the Legion class. Uh, I think anytime you make a Transformer that a kid can just throw in their book bag and take a few to school and then they can play with their friends and duke it out in the schoolyard on the battlefield, it, it, it adds a certain type of play value to a figure that maybe something like a Titan class, as great as it is, does not necessarily have. So the core class won me over Wave one, I think Vertebrake was fantastic. I loved Rat Trap. The Optimus Prime is solid. Um, wave two, my reviews of Megatron and Starscream recently went up. Loved both. Starscream's transformation was surprisingly fun. Megatron holds a little version of his G1 weapon mode. I love it. Uh, and the deco for a figure of the size is fantastic. And you know what? It looks like they're going to keep it up because this sound wave looks incredible. He's G1 centric to the core, transforming from a very G1 robot mode with opening chest panel with mini non transformable laser beak inside. And then he becomes his micro cassette recorder mode. Uh, it's often called a boom box, but I'm trying to, you know, skirt both sides here. Uh, but he is beautiful. Uh, I am really impressed by the level of detail they got, the deco, the sculpt, and I'm going to buy at least two or three of them because I want one on my desk at work, I want one on my desk at home, and I want one maybe just kicking around my backpack so when I'm bored commuting or something, I can play with it. Uh, the other figure is a redeco, and you know we're going to get them. Uh, Dracodon is a redeco of Vertebrake from Wave 1 of the core class. In Instead of these dark, kind of almost alien-esque colors, uh, Dracodon is in a neon green kind of crazy uh, radioactive uh, type uh, set of colors. And I, I think he looks great. He looks to be like a toy we would have gotten in the 90s uh, when neon was everywhere and everything was brightly colored or pastel. Uh, he really is a fun throwback to that. I think the most recent time we've had toys that kind of played with that color palette was maybe Beast Hunters around that era. And even that, don't think about it too hard, folks, but that was a while ago. So uh, that is Kingdom. All right. So here's the awesome part. It wasn't just about Kingdom today. It could have easily been, uh, but there were a couple surprise reveals. Now, the next reveal was actually spoiled a few days ago by accident, actually only two days ago, I think, by accident, when Hasbro Pulse accidentally listed this figure very briefly. I don't think there were images. I think it was just a description. And then they took it down within a few hours. And that figure is Shattered Glass Blur, okay? Now, let's go back a bit. What Shattered Glass? I don't expect everyone to know what it is, okay? Shattered Glass was a series uh, introduced by the BotCon convention back in 2008. Uh, Shattered Glass featured a universe where the Autobots and Decepticons reverse roles, your traditional Star Trek mirror mirror type universe, a trope that science fiction has played with for decades. Um, and back then, Fun Publications and I uh, figured that, hey, why couldn't the Transformers kind of play in that sandbox for a while too? We had actually been talking about it for a couple of years, and we weren't sure it would actually fly. Uh, but then uh, the folks at Fun Publications posted a April Fool's <laughs> comic book featuring this hypothetical shattered glass universe. And you know what? Fans ate it up, even though it was meant to be satire and meant to be silly and funny. And I'm so glad they did, uh, because I was then uh, able to coordinate with the folks at Fun Pub and wrote the first issue of the Shattered Glass BotCon comic, which uh, I wrote as a very dark take on a Transformers universe. Almost uh, my original concept was almost like this was the universe that Primus abandoned, that there was just no good to be had in this universe as far as he could tell. And he had to go fight Unicron elsewhere. And that's where his power had to go. So the light of Unicron 
uh, I thought, sorry, the light of Primus uh, left this universe and that's what made it such a dark image. Now, that concept got tweaked later by other writers and many people, very talented people took it on after that. Uh, I got to jump back into the Shattered Glass universe one more time uh, several years later at BotCon. But once the BotCon convention ended, I was very sad to think that, you know what, that was it. Shattered Glass is never going to come back. Other concepts could come back, characters like Flame War or so on, who were created for BotCon have managed to return in other forms. But I always felt like Shattered Glass as an alt universe concept was a little too much for an official toy line. And you know what? Hasbro has proved me wrong. And I am good with that because it was a thrill to see Shattered Glass represented on an official Hasbro presentation being released as what I'll call mainline products. And still retain, at least from what I've seen in these preview images, some of the aesthetics that we had laid down, oh gosh, over 10 years ago. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, Blur is, he looks fantastic. He is a redeco slash retool of the studio series Blur, which is already a great representation of the character. Um, he has the eye patch and kind of the messed up looking face, the scars and everything. I really think he looks evil. Like you cannot look at this guy and think, oh, that's a good guy. No, he, this is a bad dude. And, you know, someone asked me online if I had any feelings about, well, Ben, how do you feel about someone else in IDW taking over the reins of Shattered Glass and kind of taking ownership of it? And you know what? It's fine. You know? I am very happy that fans remember that Fun Publications and I had done work on Shattered Glass way back when. I, I think all these things have to evolve and grow, and I don't own any of these things, right? I worked on it, um, you know, sort of as a contractor, and I understood at the time, once I hand the script in, it belongs to Hasbro, and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, my pleasure was just knowing that for a short time, I cast the net out into fandom and that fandom, some of fandom, uh, enjoyed the work that I did. And that's satisfaction enough for me. And to see it grow into something like this, which is potentially a subline of shattered glass figures being reduced at mass retail or online retail, uh, to me, it's an honor. To, uh, to me, it feels great. And I look forward to seeing what a new group of people do when they take over the reins. All right, so uh, the Transformers team saved the best for last, I, I think, uh, in, in terms of surprise value. So they brought in uh, Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes, yes, that Kevin Smith and Jason Mewes, to introduce the auto-transforming Optimus Prime figure that was developed by Robeson in conjunction, in partnership with Hasbro. So my understanding is that this figure has actually existed in some form for well over a year already. I saw videos of it making the rounds on Facebook last year, and there were many people who kept wondering, well, what is this? Is this a third party figure? Is it something that's faked? You know, so a lot of people thought it was CG. Um, and it kind of just faded out. I know a few people did manage to get their hands on that figure, but I think it was very smart of Hasbro to swoop in and see an opportunity and say, well, okay, how do we, one, make this an official thing? And how do we make it better? And they did that. So they, instead of, you know, working against RoboCent or trying to create their own, they seem to have partnered up with them. This is considered a team up figure. That's how it's being labeled. And uh, it is being released with Peter Collins' voice, with official uh, Transformers iconography on it in the traditional Optimus Prime design and colors. This is an official product even though it may have started its life as sort of a experimental let's call it third party or fan product okay now here's the thing first of all having uh smith and muse introduce this toy was freaking brilliant they are two very talented people and they know how to do an intro video um when they first appeared and there was this optimus prime-esque truck sitting in front of them in the video i will tell you i thought it was cg because the lights were glowing in the back, the rear lights were on, and they're talking to it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, this kind of looks like that thing I saw last year on Facebook. Is this some type of like fake out, funny, you know, comedy bit that they're doing to kind of end off, you know, the event on? 
I thought, all right, let, let's see where this goes. And as they kept telling the prime figure to do things, I am not kidding you folks. Every command they gave it, every time it did something, my jaw dropped. And I think they were very smart in the way they did things. First, they showed the thing transforming. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right. That's kind of a given if you're going to be all fancy about it. But then they showed that he's kind of heaving, almost like breathing or venting hot air, just standing there. I'm like, oh, okay. So they're really trying to make this thing look alive. By the way, at that time, I still thought it might be CG. And then they had it walk. Then they had it swinging weapons. Then they had it punching. Then they had it transform back. Then they had it roll forward in vehicle mode. And for, I kid you not, folks, for that entire presentation, I just sat there, jaw on my desk, brain exploding. I mean, I started sweating because I was like, no, no freaking way. This cannot be. This cannot exist. This cannot be a thing that I am seeing right now. There is no possible way Hasbro has put something like this out. But by the end of the video and by the time the pre-orders went out, yeah, it's real. And there was this really quiet moment for me where I was just silent thinking the implications of this were mind blowing because almost like what I said about the arc, this was something my friends and I in grade school had speculated about. Oh my God, wouldn't it be cool if there was an Optimus Prime that could transform itself? And I'll be honest, the closest I thought we'd ever get to that would be a jump starter right? <laughs> or, or a battle charger or maybe those gravity bot figures from the first movie line. I thought, OK, you know, auto transform is possible to some extent, but it's never going to be like he's coming out of a cartoon transforming. And I never thought he would speak in the voice and have lights and have action. Uh, and, and here we are. Here we are now. Uh, as stunned as I am, uh, this, I realized, you know, there's going to be a price to this. This thing is going to cost mint. And you know what? I was right. Um, at a $699 price point, this is probably one of the most expensive Transformers items ever put out in, uh, by Hasbro. Uh, this actually beats out the HasLab Unicron figure, which was $575, but I get it with the electronics involved, with the number of parts involved, with a partnership slash licensing agreement involved, uh, which tells me that some of the riches have to be shared. Uh, I'm not shocked that it's that high. Now, I was shocked when I first saw the price, but after I let it sink in, I realized, okay, I get what's happening here. And to me, this is not something I want them to do every year. I'm not sure I want to have an entire line of these. I think for now, at least, uh, to me, this is a really beautiful one-off special kind of product that may or may not ever happen again. And if that's the case, then I want to enjoy it. Um, and I want to give it a very special place uh, in my display. I think I'm going to clear out at the top shelf or one of my other shelves for it. Um, and yeah. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I ordered. Yeah, it happened before I even knew what was going on. So anyway, um, I'm enthusiastic about it. Now, criticisms. Yes, I have seen some criticisms online. Uh, it's too rich for some people's blood. Darn straight. And you know what? Real life comes first. You got to pay your bills. You got to pay your rent. You got to make sure your family's taken care of. You got to do these things first. All that comes before it anything I just talked about. So absolutely, if you need to pay bills, if you have rent to pay and this takes us out of the running, you know what? It's as awesome as it is. It's just a toy <laughs> at the end of the day. And you have to take care of business first. Okay. So the other thing is, you know, some fans are thinking, well, it's a toy I can't really play with, right? It's not, you're not physically manipulating it the way you would, well, any of the other figures that we talked about tonight. Well, you know, yes and no, right? Uh, first of all, uh, the vo to me, the voice command feature is a form of play, right? It, it's it's a very different form of play that I think we're used to as action figure collectors, because we're used to manipulating these three dimensional objects with our hands, uh, and it's a very sensory uh, type of experience. And I completely get that. I, you know, I've been an action figure collector for thirty years now plus, and I of course I get that, but. 
I also respect that there is a new type of play where there are products where the joy of it is actually partially not having to manipulate it, not having to touch it physically. Uh, a few years ago, they released a uh, BB-8 by Sphero, uh, and it was controlled by an app on your phone. And you, uh, you know, people love that thing, not because you had to like push it along with your head to get it to roll along, but that this app just controlled it and it rolled on on this ball, like just like the character in the movie. That was a certain type of play. And I think that similar type of play is what is at work here. Um, in addition, I would say, you know, this also does have an app. So if you enjoy having kind of that app slash physical object relationship in your play, then there you go. Uh, you, you have an app that has Optimus Prime in it and you can manipulate him from there. Uh, I think either way you choose to do it, it is a valid form of play, but it is a very different form of play. Uh, than what we have traditionally seen in the Transformers line. So those are my thoughts on the figure. Uh, yes, expensive as all get out, not for everybody. Uh, as, as I like to tell my friends, I got it because I'm crazy. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's about it. If you don't want to be crazy, then you can stay away from it. All right. So everyone, that is the end of this video. I want to thank everybody for staying this long. If you did, hearing me ramble on about a bunch of space robots. And uh, I hope everyone, uh, if you didn't get to attend the Fan Fest, uh, you can watch it below. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's a fun presentation. The team's really worked hard to make it uh, informative and entertaining. I want to thank Hasbro for its consideration in putting such an event together, but also for all the press materials that they have forwarded to me for BWTF.com. And I thank all you fans for your long time and continued support. It means the world to me that you're watching this. It means the world to me that you visit my website even after all this time. Thank you till all are one. Have a good night.